Okay, this is video one for the lifting mechanisms unit notes. Uh, for this uh, unit, I want you to understand what a degree of freedom is. I want you to understand how to reduce shock. I want you to be able to discuss various types of lifting mechanisms. And I want you to describe what passive assistance is. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, <clears throat> you know, many different competitions for uh, VEX competitions require you to elevate or reorient some sort of game object. So we need to be able to design some sort of lifting mechanism. Uh, I believe for this year's competition in 2015, uh, there's a part where you can lift up a partner robot. So <clears throat> to get started here, let's talk about degrees of freedom. Uh, it refers to something's ability to move in a single independent direction of motion. And uh, to be able to move in multiple directions means to have multiple degrees of freedom. So, for example, moving up and down is one degree of freedom. Moving left and right is another. Um, and then the ability to move up and down and left and right then would be two degrees of freedom. Before we get started with uh, the rest of those, um, when we look at a, a coordinate system, We actually have three axes. We have um, a y-axis, an x-axis, and a z-axis. So the ability to move along any one of those three axes would be a degree of freedom. So right there are three degrees of freedom. And then rotating around each of those axes would be three more degrees of freedom. So in total, we have six degrees of freedom. So let's uh, talk about this in a little further detail. So the first one, twisting. So looking at this uh, particular arm here, it has uh, a couple of degrees of freedom here. So um, we have some twisting motion on the, the knuckle, it's, or the, the part that allows the pinchers to open up. We have uh, some twisting motion here. So right there would be at least two different degrees of freedom. If you were to uh, you know, design and build this, um, you would have to make sure that these are separate parts. And you would want to attach a motor to that big gear there. That way that would uh, cause it to twist. So that would be your twisting motion. Here's a couple examples of some linear motion. So here's a, uh, a platform that can rise up and down. So that would only have one degree of freedom. In this part right here, this picture, uh, we have something that can slide in and out, so that's one degree of freedom. And also we have some twisting, so that'd be a second degree of freedom. And it looks like up here in this pinchers, we have some more twisting, so that would be like a, a third degree of freedom. So in these multiple, um, multiple, uh, or more complex systems, we can have multiple degrees of freedom. Here we have rotation. That's about an axis perpendicular to an arm. So here we have our degree of freedom. We see that here this knuckle is locked together, so there's no degrees of freedom. Yeah, it's stuck in place. So for a degree of freedom, remember, in total, we have six degrees of freedom. All right, now let's go ahead and get into uh, a little more detail here. Um, we're going to begin by talking about elevators. Uh, elevators have one degree of freedom, and they use linear motion to pick up objects vertically. Now an elevator must convert the rotational motion of a, a motor into linear motion. So we have a couple different ways of doing that. 
The first way is called a rack and pinion. So in the rack and pinion, the linear gears are called the rack. And the circular gear is called the pinion. So when we attach a motor to the circular gear, we can convert the motor's circular motion into linear motion and up and down. So here we have an example of this here on the right. Um, as you can see, we got our motor inside attached to a pinion gear, and that pinion gear can walk along the rack gears. Notice that this motor has to be attached. So if we think about it, we got a couple different pieces of structure here. So we got one piece here, which is attached to the motor. And then we have a second one. That can slide back and forth. I do have some special uh, pieces of structure that allow that to happen. They're called linear motion racks. And uh, they have grooved pieces that fit inside each other. So you can have uh, you know, two pieces of structure that can slide past each other like this. Now, one thing that you'll find, though, is when this elevator gets too tall, we only have one point of contact between the two pieces of structure, which means that once this gets too tall, it becomes very unstable and it can fall over. So you have to be careful. Uh, oftentimes, I suggest building a second piece here and having a gear with no motor, just having another gear here, and that provides two points of contact. And those two points of contact help make the structure more stable. Another type of elevator uses a chain and sprocket. So in this one, it's a little hard to see, but here we have a platform. and it's attached to some chain. We then have a sprocket that's being driven by a motor. And as this motor spins, it causes the platform to raise and lower. Now, with these two types, uh, the, the rack and pinion and the chain and sprocket, we can go ahead and talk about torque. Torque is a force which is perpendicular to a lever arm. So notice that for this one, the radius of this gear is a lever arm. So when we have a motor with torque, the amount of force would equal the torque from the motor divided by the radius. And we can play around with how much torque there is with some mechanical advantage. Likewise, down here, this is going to be R, so the amount of force this applies to the chain equals the torque of the motor divided by the radius of the sprocket. And that becomes important because when we have a lift, we want to know how much force it can apply. You know, how much, how much can we lift? So we can do some simple math to calculate how much we can lift. So here... On this one right here, we can, can, how much can we lift? Notice that for both of these, um, the bigger the gear, the less we can lift, which seems very counterintuitive. So with uh, both of these, you want to use small pinion gears or a small sprocket. The next type is a winch. Uh, with this, we have a spool. I think that's how you spell spool. Um, and it's motorized. 
there would also be some sort of structure back here that would hold it up. And it's simply, you know, we got a platform here. And it simply works with string. Notice that the amount of force again equals torque divided by lever arm distance. So this the radius of the spool will be your lever arm distance, and we get you know, our torque from the motor. And again, we want a small spool to get the maximum amount of force. Now, some of these uh, winches can be turned into some unique um, you know, configurations. So, for example, down here we can have our spool, and this string can go up and around another pulley and be attached. So as this winds up, it provides a downward force, which comes up to an upward force to pick up our, uh, our lever. Notice, though, that you want to make sure you have at least two points of contact. That way, this doesn't become too unstable and fall over. The last one we have, and this one's a, kind of a, a doozy, is the multiple stage lift. So here, we can have multiple parts to our lift. Now, this is all connected with one continuous chain. So maybe we would have a, a motor here and here. So we can have two motors driving this. Uh, we also have these cross braces. Notice there's two of them, so there's two points of contact. And as this motor turns, it applies a force this way. we can follow the force back and it actually causes the entire lift to elevate. Now these are really 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 hard to build. Uh, you can find some examples of people building them on YouTube um, and when they're done right they work really smoothly but they can be difficult to uh, to build and to configure. So just something to keep in mind. All right, that finishes video one. Video one.